Guys, it finally happened. We finally got another good year of movies. I say finally as if the last really great year wasn't just 2019, but that was about three years ago now. I watch so many movies that I always find something to love, but last year was rough. So I'm just so stoked that there's finally some good material, even if it is stuff that came out in 2021 at film festivals or even 2020 that now just got wide distribution. There's still a lot that's fresh and neat. Now there are still a variety of movies that I haven't had a chance to catch, like White Noise, Return to Soul, Marcel the Shell with Shoes, on, Women King, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, All Quiet on the Western Front, Till. Then some that I did see last year, but I'm kind of iffy on what would actually count as their release date because they're only getting like some minimal theatrical releases like Girl Picture and Broker. Then there's probably just a bunch of stuff that I kind of forgot about. Like I keep forgetting that Bat Pat came out this year. So if there's something you don't see here, I might have talked about it in a film festival wrap up, my TIFF video, Con, Sundance, or any of my best of videos or on the Intercut podcast, which I'll have link down below. And a big one that I've talked about before that I'm choosing to leave off this list, even though it only got wide distribution in 2022, is The Worst Person in the World because it was nominated for last year's Oscar. It is a very good post-adolescence coming of age story about indecision and the search for meaning and what you want to do in life. But that, yeah, we'll leave it. And before we hop in, this video is sponsored by you, my lovely Patreon and YouTube channel members. So let's dive into some honorable mentions. A lot of these could honestly be in my top 10 or very close to it, uh, it is, vi I'm very indecisive. Starting with Pleasure, which is an incredibly powerful movie about the realities of the porn industry and is an incredibly difficult watch for that reason. I'm so happy that Neon ended up picking this up after A24 wanted to edit it down to get a different rating because I do believe it deserves to exist as it's intended. I just strongly recommend doing your own research into this movie before watching it. If you're someone who's sensitive to uh, SA uh, and any kind of like graphic brutality kind of stuff like that, I, I would caution certain viewers. Broker is one that I talked about in my can video that is getting a staggered release right now, so I didn't quite know where to include it, and I want to revisit it before I would figure out where it would go on the list, but I do strongly recommend it. The Fallout is another really heavy one that deals with a school shooting starring Jenna Ortega. She's an absolute powerhouse in this movie that feels so authentic and how it would feel to deal with this situation. I've talked about it before, and it's a definite recommend. Babylon was a huge mess of a spectacle by Damien Chazelle. A lot of people are hating it and it's a lot of movie and it's very long, but it's this super interesting look at a period of time where the entire landscape of making movies was changing and how it affected everyone in it, from the actors to the filmmakers to the producers to the people that are just there trying to party. Bones and All really infected my mind since making my video, which you should watch for all my thoughts. My friend described it as Prestige Twilight and that's where we'll leave it. Barbarian was a super fun horror with some great performances, but I wish it had a better ending. Full video on that link below as well. The Northman is a massive revenge epic by Robert Eggers. The Fablemans is a beautifully dramatized version of Spielberg's own life, how he grew into filmmaking as a means to gain control over the things in life, and then has it be the catalyst that reveals a horrible truth within his family. This is his first movie in a long time that feels like it has that Spielberg magic that we've known and loved before. Fresh is another horror movie that I loved and had a lot of fun with that I have a full video on. The Menu is one I still plan to talk about in full, but Anya Taylor-Joy is just fantastic in this dark comedy, but I think there's just something small missing that is holding it back from being truly fantastic, but I still think it's absolutely worth the watch. Emily the Criminal is one of the more unique roles for Aubrey Plaza and not a spin-off of Emily in Paris, contrary to the belief of some. Triangle of Sadness was one of the big ones out of con, and for good reason. This is a wild multi-stage satire with some wickedly good performances. It goes off the rails, features new noise by Refuse, definitely worth checking out. Duel is a super unique one by Riley Stearns about a world where you can clone yourself in the event of terminal illness to ease the pain to a loved one, but if you don't die, you have to duel your clone to the death. And one that I am exceedingly excited to see get wide distribution, mainly so I can watch it again, Sanctuary, starring Margaret Qualley and Christopher Abbott. I talk about it extensively in my TIFF video, but it's just this perfect little movie about a guy stepping into a CEO role who needs to end his relationship, we'll say, with a dominatrix while she spends the evening trying to convince him why he needs her. It's got some downright psychological torture at times, but goddamn, I love it. Expect a full video on that once it releases. 
choices. So now down to our top 13 because I can't commit to a top 15. RRR isn't just the best action movie of the year, it's the best spectacle of the year. I know Top Gun Maverick is super exhilarating, there's some great stunts there, but RRR is just an absolute delight. It's hilarious and heartfelt, the kind of movie that should have Hollywood blockbusters squirming and it's just right there on Netflix. Number 12, The Batman. I know I just said that I forgot this one came out this year, but I recently rewatched it and I just, I just love so much of it. I love how he just starts as this agent of the shadows existing as a tool for vengeance and fear before having that ideology thrown right back at him by the very people he's trying to stop. Ultimately realizing that to make change he needs to be more the people need hope. Vibes were immaculate, the theme is a powerhouse, and I'll never get tired of Pattinson's sad little ooh woo please be nice to me faces as like Gordon's letting him go through the investigation. Now this is one that's been bopping around my top 10, but I've decided since I've talked about it before and I saw it a couple years ago, now I'm gonna leave it at 11 and it's on the count of three. Another one starring Christopher Abbott and Gerard Carmichael, who also directed it, on the count of three is about lifelong best friends who decide to end their lives. That sounds depressing as hell, right? Well, it is, but it's also hilarious. Suffocation, no breathing, don't give a what? No, I don't listen to Atlanta's more set when I'm going through a breakup and I'm not listening to Papa Roach on the day I'm gonna kill myself. Before they do the deed, they decide to use this last day to take care of any unfinished business with the people in their lives. I'm still not quite sure how I feel about the ending, but it definitely was a daring choice. But because of that subject matter, this is another one that I can't recommend to everyone. I walked away from it seeing the positives in life, but if you're struggling, that might not end up being your takeaway, so please be cautious. Now into our top 10 and I'm starting with my like chaos entry that I just can't stop thinking about and it's Bullet Train. I don't even know why this on this list. It's a chaotic mess, but you know what? It's just my kind of chaotic mess and I love it. I will ruin your life the way you ruin mine. <laughs> Dude, I don't even know you! I remember I went to the theaters that day alone while filming the podcast so I could watch Bodies, 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 which should have been the perfect movie for me. And then I was like largely disappointed by it. Rachel Sennett is a queen though. And then I just like wandered over and grabbed a ticket to Bullet Train to follow it up. And I had a blast. I think it's mainly going here because I just can't stop thinking about how much fun I had when watching it. And you know what? It's my list. I can do what I want with it. Multiple people all trying to complete missions that all conflict with one another on the world's fast fastest train, good times all around. Number nine, Glass Onion. Knives Out was one of the best movies in a year that was loaded with amazing movies. And Glass Onion is also one of the best movies in a year that has a lot of amazing movies in it. I talked about it in my TIFF video and I was so happy that I was able to catch the world premiere of this at TIFF, not only so that I could like say that I was at the, the world first premiere, first showing, first group of people who saw Glass Onion, but also just because I got a chance to see it on the big screen with an excited audience. But it was also just as entertaining and catching it at home with my mom over the holidays. It's been really fun to compare notes on what people didn't notice that I did and what other people caught on to early. But even if you start piecing together the answers faster than the movie lays them out, it's just an incredibly fun watch. I don't think I like it quite as much as the original, but it's still a blast. I want nothing more than Daniel Craig's time as Benoit Blanc to overpower his time as Bond. And honestly, I feel like we're getting there very quickly. Do you see Daniel Craig as James Bond memes floating around everywhere? No. It's Benoit Blanc, baby. Number eight, After Yang by Koganada isn't gonna be the movie for everyone, but it's one of the more unique sci-fi movies I've ever seen. All of Koganada's projects have a very particular feeling to them and it's not absent here in the slightest. It's a slow, beautifully reflective movie that ultimately explores so many aspects of existence, grief, and what it means to be alive while weaving in a variety of other extremely strong concepts like identity and race. I could spend so much time talking about this movie and, and maybe I still will someday, but it takes place in a future that simultaneously feels very different and very similar to what we're used to. It's a reality where human cloning has become the norm over birth, but a lot of people are against clones like our main family, who instead adopt a young Chinese girl and end up with an android named Yang to act as a cultural tie to her heritage that doubles as a big brother and babysitter. I think one of the more interesting things I noticed is that both the parents have accents from somewhere in Europe, but the daughter has an American accent and Yang has 
has an American accent and it almost feels like he would have maybe been more responsible for kind of raising her in that way and teaching her language. But when Yang malfunctioned, Jake's brought down a path that feels equal parts self-discovery and an exploration into the rich existence Yang lived and how Yang's existence was so much more rich and individualistic than he could have ever imagined. Number seven, Dinner in America by Adam Carter Raymeyer. Do you think I'm weird? Oh yeah, no, you're fucking weird. Well, is weird cool? In your case, no. Now I've talked about Dinner in America in just about every best of list since I talked about it back at Sundance 2020, which is like just about three years ago at this point. And the reason I get to mention it again is because it finally got wide distribution. You can actually watch this movie on streaming services now. This might not be the movie for everyone, but those who like it seem to really love it. It's one of the movies that I get the most thanks and acknowledgement for recommending, and I think it's a blast. It's this adorably aggressive little punk rock movie about the lead singer of a punk band on the run from the law who meets this very weird girl named Patty who's obsessed with punk music. And while she's helping him lay low, he's helping her learn to stand up for herself as the two form this unconventional relationship. It stars Kyle Gallner, who I am a huge fan of, Emily Skaggs, and we got some Griffin Gluck in there. It, it should be free on Hulu right now, I'm pretty sure. Number six, Tar by Todd Field. Just the first of two movies I'll be talking about that you can find some comparisons with Whiplash, but this is absolutely the more obvious of the two. This is the kind of movie that you'll get something different from every time you watch it. Our perception of Lydia Tarr as a character shifts constantly. Everything she does is a performance from her interviews to how she interacts with the people around her. People are really hung up on trying to frame this movie around cancel culture in some ways, but I feel like they're just getting these individual clips and not realizing how those clips relate to the larger piece of the movie. And I feel like those people haven't actually watched the movie and probably wouldn't like the movie if they did. This is a pretty intense look at ego and narcissism and what happens when someone who's curated every aspect of their life to conform to their self-perceived greatness has that pulled away from them due to their own actions. There's a lot going on here, a lot of different ways it can be examined, but it's also absolutely hilarious. Like I lost it as it went into that final scene. Nothing could have compared me for what I had just watched building into that conclusion. I'm honestly just scratching the surface of what you can find in this movie, and I'm sure I'll notice more in future watches. And I'm certainly not trying to portray myself as a holier than now. I just think that some people are taking a very shallow look at this movie that has so many different angles. Number five, After Sun by Charlotte Wells. After Sun is an absolute gut punch of a movie, a reflective piece out of the need to understand a life-changing event. This is a daughter looking back at a vacation that she took with her father, trying to piece together things she might have missed, a piece she wouldn't have been able to understand as a child and see herself as her father saw her through these recordings. It's as much a coming of age story as it is a look at a man who became a father far too young, doesn't feel like he can give his daughter all she deserves, doing his best while dealing with the deep sadness. It's hauntingly beautiful, probably Paul Mescal's best role to date. And Frankie Corio just knocks it out of the park. Like I'm not talking like best first acting role here. I'm shocked that this is her first role. She was phenomenal. It has a really unique vibe because so many of the moments we're watching are happy ones, but there's this beautifully mournful undercurrent throughout the film that builds the more we realize what we're watching while waiting for something that's never coming. Number four, Everything Everywhere All at Once by The Daniels. <laughs> Now this one might be popping up a little bit earlier on my list than some people anticipated, but this is essentially the movie of the year. This started as the beloved underdog and got swept in a well-deserved storm, except now it's gotten to the point that people are fighting about which actors are being nominated. But the movie really is everything in so many ways. It's a give a shit movie, as I lovingly like to refer to them. Ki Hui Kwan deserves the world, and I have an entire video about this movie that I'll link down below that I was super proud of, so if you haven't caught it, I would recommend checking it out. I talk about all sorts of stuff, like how they do the effects and a lot of the background stuff. So I, I think it's worth watching. So down to the final three, starting with Decision to Leave by acclaimed director Park Chan-wook. This was one I was super excited to catch at con and it did not disappoint at all. It's not as difficult a watch as Old Boy or The Handmaiden. So for anybody who might be concerned about that, I, I think you're a little bit more safe here or a lot more safe here. But this is just such an emotional heavy hitter with a solid romantic drive all wrapped in a crime story. Decision to Leave follows 
a seasoned detective, Hai Jun, investigating the unusual death of a man falling off a mountaintop. Suspicion inevitably falls on the wife, but he can't get over the attraction he feels building for her that seems to be mutual. The two have this weird dynamic where she seems more concerned that he'll stop having a reason to look into her life than if he'll find evidence of her guilt. And he's clouded by his own relief that she's brought him some kind of peace to his restless nights. And beyond the craft of the writing and the way the two interact, this movie is just shot gorgeously. So many subtleties to the shots or angles you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's really breathtaking. We just get a truly intimate look at these two central characters and what they believe the other is matching and balancing within themselves, one that I'm super excited to revisit again and again. Honestly, my top four could be interchangeable, but in the number two slot, I'm gonna stick Banshees of Inna Sharon. The other night, two hours you spent talking to me about the things you found in your little donkey shite that day. Well, it wasn't me little donkey shite, it was me pony shite, which shows how much you were listening. I talked about this one extensively in my TIFF video, but this is a perfectly crafted tragic comedy. I don't know if I've seen something that toes the line of comedy and drama so effectively in my life. What starts as a simple premise, what happens when you wake up one morning and your best friend suddenly decides he doesn't want to be friends with you anymore, morphs into something exceedingly complex while still maintaining solid comedy throughout. It all takes place on a fictional Irish island at the tail end of the Irish Civil War, and while the literal war is waging just across the sea, the war between these two friends becomes just as volatile, entirely enveloping this small town. The more Farrell tries to fix the friendship, the more resolved in his ultimatum Gleason becomes. What starts as bewilderment quickly becomes obsession. An obsession from both parties that leads to a rather violent ultimatum that's essentially cutting your nose to spite your face. Farrell and Gleason are just masterful in their roles. Farrell in particular is having a really great year, but I think these are some career bests for each of them. And it's not just them, the supporting cast is incredible too. Not just Kyogen and Condon who are essential to the story, but everyone from the bartender to the regulars to the priest. I might still end up making a video comparing this to Whiplash, something that face value might not seem to make much sense, but there's core ideas at each of these movies that play through counter to each other in their execution. Both ask a variation of essentially the same question. What matters more, being kind to the people around you in your life or doing things to be remembered? Both lead characters to extreme lengths, and I love both sides of that conversation. This movie made me laugh, it made me cry, at times I was horrified. It's impressive for a movie to achieve such a range of emotions so flawlessly because the humor is truly some of the best in recent memory, and I would die for Jenny the Donkey. You should definitely watch this movie. And number one, a very unconventional choice, but one that is highly related to personal emotions around the time I watched this movie, Cha Cha Real Smooth. So at the beginning of 2021, I was starting to question whether whether I could experience joy anymore. Not even just joy from media, just joy. No Way Home and Scream 5 were huge letdowns to me and I was so excited for both of them, but then everyone around me seemed to love them. Like I still remember how I felt in the movie theater lobby after Scream 5. Let me show you what my Letterboxd review was. Once again, feeling insane looking at reviews, please end me or find my joy for life. I hated so much of this. So yeah, not a good time. And then I really felt like most of my favorite movies from 2021 were things that I had seen in 2020. And then I got to Sundance 2022. My friends had rented an Airbnb, we had a theater room, and we popped it on while I was working on that aforementioned Scream video. And in that moment, my life was changed for the better. Cha Cha Real Smooth follows Andrew, who's back home after graduating college, and like so many people in this world, he's in that limbo state of not really knowing what comes next. So he unintentionally starts trying to integrate himself into other people's lives before ultimately getting the opportunity to be the party starter for the local bar mitzvahs. But when he meets a local mom, Domino, and her daughter, he he thinks he's figured out his future, even if it's not his own. And this is just a solid coming of age of someone realizing that at some point, you've got to start your own party. There's a conversation that Andrew and Domino have about what it even means to be happy, and that's where I really lost it in that basement theater room. It's really beautiful and funny and a little bit sad. But if it's the kind of story that you can personally resonate with, which I realize not everyone can, it'll hit hard. And it's not just Andrew, it might be Dakota's character that ends up resonating with you more. Cooper Rafe, the writer, director, and lead actor just has a way of making his characters feel so rich, like each of them could spin off as the main character in the same story with a slightly different focus. It's not gonna be the movie for everyone, but I just feel like there's this 
earnest quality from Rafe that makes things that should come across as cringe feel genuinely wholesome. And that's the reason why it's my number one. It's the kind of movie I needed that found me at exactly the moment I needed it most. But it obviously wasn't a perfect year for cinema, so let's go through some of the stinkers and bigger disappointments. I ran out of time to record at my parents' place, so here I am for this next section. Starting with Don't Worry Darling. This is firmly in the biggest disappointment category. A new Florence Pugh movie where she is genuinely giving a powerhouse performance, which seemed like a super interesting concept, and then some really interesting tidbits of the plot, and it was all completely wasted. I did have a great time talking about it though, and going through the original scripts and comparing it to the movie, so be sure to check that out. Scream or Scream 5. Okay, look, I realize it's not terrible, but it's easily the biggest disappointment of 2022 for me. I've been waiting for a new Scream movie since the fourth one came out. I loved it so much. Scream is one of my all-time favorite franchises. The first Scream is just one of my favorite movies of all time in general. So when you're that hyped for something, if it just doesn't live up, it's, it's gonna be one of your biggest disappointments. I hate the twist. I hate the weird supernatural angle that seems to be tossed in. I am not remotely a fan of the main girls acting and I hope they kill her off so we can just focus with uh, you know Jenna Ortega here and I'm only watching part six because they have baited me with Kirby coming back otherwise I honestly wouldn't bother because of the disrespect towards Nev Campbell but sliding into a horror movie that was genuinely bad Texas Chainsaw Massacre the Netflix reboot thing. I have an entire video about this one too. I actually had a blast talking about the movie, but it was ass. It had very weird politics and social commentary that I had no interest in following through on, but some of those kill scenes were incredible, very fun to watch, but overall disaster of a movie. And the next one is the biggest meme movie of the year that got all the more hilarious because Sony didn't quite realize why it was a meme and messed it up even more by re-releasing it, Morbius, which not just a meme, also a terrible movie. I don't even know if I need to say anything about it. I have a full video about Morbius, but it, it just barely feels like a movie. It's like someone took a series and then cut that down to a Cliff Notes version and then edited it all together and was like, huh, that's about the length of a movie. The fact that it was delayed so many times, had reshoots and still doesn't come together feeling like a movie, impressive. Then you guys get a little two for one with 365 days part two this day and the next 365 days. I don't know if Netflix thought their window for releasing these movies was running out, but for some reason they released both of them in like a four month period. In both of these movies, it's like they heard the many complaints that the acting from the main characters was just atrocious, probably mostly because English is not any of these people's first language, which is fine. You can still be a really good good actor if English isn't your first language, no one's going at that, but you know, instead of steering into it to make it funny or working on it for the next one, uh, they just decided to replace most of the conversations with mini music videos and music video fucktages. So that was most of the last two movies, but then they end the whole thing off with a cliffhanger because they refused to commit to one of the mob boyfriends for her. The book at least took a harsh stance. When it's done, you know who she ends up with, but the movie was like, Guys, uh, we really don't want to do like Massimo the abuser too much because like people really seem to like him. So we're going to keep him pretty damn abusive, but we're not going to make her leave him or anything. Madness. Make sure to check out my videos on the movie and the books. And if you're waiting to see after on this list, it's not even gonna make it because it at least had the good common decency to make the most recent installment an entertaining shit show with house fires. It feels like they watched my review on the last one and said, you're right, Amanda, this was not entertaining. We will steer into it. Ignoring the fact that they filmed them both at the same time. Another one from the Netflix repertoire of bad decisions, but maybe not because they got views is Purple Hearts. The very weird liberal meets conservative military love story that's cute as long as you ignore all the parts where he says concerning things about her race and family. I feel like my brain has beat down most of the details about that movie, so check out my video for full details. And how could we ever forget MGK's shitty stoner flick, Good Morning? Not even Megan Fox could save this one, even with her character being the best 
best one of the movie but again full video on this one you can check out down below but yeah not not very good blonde is one that i didn't bother talking about at all because i just don't want to put myself through that or put any of you through watching that but what a disgustingly exploitative piece of dramatized garbage i'm fine with things kind of towing the line when it comes to like a biopic or expressing what someone's life might have been like and what they might have gone through but this one just takes it way over the top with a bunch of hypotheticals about a woman who can't even find peace from exploitation in death. There's like an entire weird abortion scene. And it's, I can't. The sun isn't quite out for most people yet, but I'm going to mention it because, oh wow, holy shit, is it not good. The follow-up to The Father, which was a super unique take on Alzheimer's and how you can express that through film, the sun is insultingly bad. It largely focuses on a father trying to deal with his son who's struggling with depression, but it comes across as grossly manipulative. This kind of movie should make me hate the kid who's dealing with depression, but that's pretty much what we're left with. And how can you express the story properly to us if we have no empathy for the titular character? It's the titular role! Zeller said that his intention with this was to highlight the epidemic of teen depression, but he did an abysmally insulting job of it. I hated this movie. Now we got some honorable mentions before we dive into the worst of the year. And we got Firestarter, which is only not on the full list because it is just too boring to bother mentally rehashing it. Full video link down below. They slashed them, which felt pretty damn homophobic for something that was supposed to be making a stand against homophobes. It's just super lazy and boring. And I didn't want to talk about it because it just seemed insulting. Jurassic World Dominion is saving itself purely by being better than Fallen Kingdom. The Disney Pinocchio, which was some kind of dystopian nightmare. Moonfall is a movie so bad that I forget almost all of it, but then get vivid memories of what like happened towards the end because it seemed like it was trying to go in an interesting direction, but no one involved was smart enough to get it there. So it's just another shitty disaster movie, which leads us into the worst dash cam. The found footage horror movie that I caught back at TIFF 2021. Holy shit, I hate this movie and I hate it even more now that I know that the main girl isn't just playing some caricature. She's literally just the person that the characters are made of. I hadn't bothered doing any further research, but apparently she is. That's just what she's like in real life. They just strapped a camera to her. I know a lot of people had a really good time with it, but it broke through my annoying threshold. And the second something does that, it, I, the whole project becomes shit. It's also the reason why I hate Woman in the Window so much. But that's gonna do it for this year's list. Again, if there's something that you feel like I missed, feel free to put it down below, but I might have talked about it in another video. Apologies if your favorite movie isn't here, and apologies if I didn't get a chance to watch whatever movie was your favorite. Let me know what your guys' top 10 lists are down below. I'm always interested to see what you guys enjoyed. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. All my social medias are linked down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.